Welcome to the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast, where our hosts, Jeffrey Wilson and Pat Militic, probe the minds of experts from a vast spectrum of knowledge on how to best prepare for the inevitable emergency situation to come. Jeffrey and Pat and the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast are your insurance policy moving forward. And now, here they are. The hosts of the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast, Jeffrey Wilson and Pat Militich. Hello to everybody and welcome to the second episode of the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast. And we're excited to be putting the band back together again, only for this episode as I just mentioned. This is the 360 degree viewpoint of asymmetrical self-defense. A lot of components to that as we through those people are going to learn all about it and what we're talking about. But bring in my co-host, of course, Jeffrey Wilson, who he and I co-host Conspiracy Farm together. And we spent a lot of time telling people kind of what was coming and all that stuff came to fruition. And now it's time to talk solutions. And Jeff, uh, happy again to have you with me, buddy. Absolutely, man. Always good to be here. Always good to be here. Um, like I said, we we diagnosed a great many of issues and now we're trying to talk about uh, what now? What do we do now? In the face yeah. of unpredictability, you know, it's not just, like you said, when you talk about 360 degree, all encompassing, asymmetric self care, uh, self defense, I mean, it's literally, it's literally that all encompassing physical, spiritual, mental, financial, et cetera. So in this unpredictable world, you're not just surviving, but you're, you're thriving and flourishing as well as your family. Yes, that is, that is the goal. And, now I'll bring in our guest who's sitting next to me, Kevin Flack from Downrange Supplements and Downrange Excursions. He's done a, an awful lot for his fellow veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And kind of Kevin, just give us a quick rundown of, of your history yeah. and what you're doing today. Yeah, well, th thanks for having me, Pat, Jeff, guys. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to sit down and chop it up with you guys. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we, we work uh, primarily, we target the, the veteran and first responder market in terms of the supplement company and the nonprofit was the precursor to that, which we started back in 2015. Um, and the whole premise is to promote healthy, active, alternative uh, methods to help combat veterans and first responders alike mitigate service-related issues, right? Um, release natural endorphins through physical activity, grounding and collecting themselves through wilderness therapy, kayaking, just camping out in the grass, hiking, right? Um, all those things, controlling cortisol levels and helping mitigate depression. Um, through proper diet and nutrition. And, and that's where the supplementation and physical fitness part um, comes into the supplement company. Um, but these are all, all methods that have been used for an extremely long time, but they just haven't been prevalent in today's society because keeping people sick is return business, right? So we're, 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 we're in the business with downrange supplements and excursions to promote healthy and active lifestyle with high quality products in terms to, liter to be able to literally give back um, to our first responder military demographics, not only representing them on the supplement side, um, but providing a platform for them to both both those demographics to come together and, and learn how to actively mitigate um, these symptoms to continue to be productive in, in their communities and, and in their families alike, right? And it almost sounds like he knows what he's talking about because he does. And, you know, a little bit, I, I know a little bit of his history. And uh, how, many, how many years have we known each other now, probably? Oh, man, um, since about 2013, 14. Okay, okay. Yeah. so yeah, I've known him for a while. And we started talking several years ago, as he just mentioned. But, you know, Kevin's been through a little bit himself. You can tell him, you know, about that, you know, some of the injuries that you've had and, yeah, and I, moving forward where you can relate to a lot of what these guys are dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I was in about eight years. I served with the 10th Mountain Division. I was an infantry squad leader by the time I, I got out of the service. Um, but I, I'm 100% rated out now, combat post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, um, some other service-related issues. When I first got out, you know, I went to school, was doing the student veteran stuff, was trying to reintegrate, be a father. Um, and I was also contracting as a family assistant specialist for the Guard Bureau. I was trying to learn um, what was going on with me. That's why I was going to school for psychology at the time. I actually ended up, throughout that process, started having a lot of struggles with, with my service-related issues. Obviously, moving to the Quad Cities, too, where I don't have you know, a, a real network aside from the child that I'm supposed to be raising um, to, to, to learn about or reintegrate properly. Um, so I ended up in the St. Cloud VA Medical Center for about three months for treatment for PTSD and TBI. Um, I left there, this, and this is the beginning of the journey that, that caused me to really open up and, and was the catalyst, right, to, to downrange excursions and supplements. 
Um, you know, and the VA has phenomenal facilities and resources, right? They're, they're federally funded. Um, they can always get better at things. Um, there's, there's people there that, that are not preventative, which, which I am preventative. And there's people there um, that, that are like a factory line that just want to get you in and out, you know, and they, they treat with pills. Um, but I don't want to take away from the good people at the VA and what they're trying to do. Um, so they symptom analyze and treat. And that's unfortunate when it comes to the combat post-traumatic stress because it's a parasympathetic nervous system issue, right? It's not a chemical imbalance. So when, when you start treating something that's, that's uh, your fight or flight system, your response has been hardwired, right? So it's offset. And that's really what, what you see with PTSD. Um, but, it's, but it's not a chemical imbalance. And the VA treats a lot with like isotalopram or other types of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, that, that are meant to level out chemical imbalances. But when you give a veteran um, you know, a medication meant to level out chemical imbalances for an issue that has nothing to do with a chemical imbalance, mm. right? You're going to create one, i.e. leading to degradation of quality of life. And you wonder why we're looking at 22 suicides a day. Um, we need to be going toward methods that are, that are healthy and active. And that, that over time, you know, human nature hasn't changed. Human beings haven't changed. This is, this is, that's what medicine should be, is naturally allowing the body to heal itself and not putting man-made drugs in yourself. Um, so anyway, when I was up at the VA, I ended up leaving. I call it the PTSD bundle. Um, it's a Talipram, Prozosin, Gabapentin, um, um, Ultram. I mean, just, and, and the list goes on and on. When I left and I was no longer in that controlled environment, I saw an extreme decline very quickly um, in my overall mental on those medications. You know, I wouldn't remember why I went from upstairs to downstairs. I, I realized that I really needed to make a change. Um, and that's when I, I adopted, I, I started going back to what I knew from being on the infantry line. So I adopted a structured routine, right? I just, I got rid of everything cold turkey. It really sucked. It was, it was hard. I don't recommend it. Titrate, do things the proper way, right? Um, but, but I was in a hard spot and, and I was going one way or the other. So I needed to make a decision. Um, so I started waking up every morning, you know, 4 a.m. You, you structure yourself, you start working out, you slowly get back into it and, and, and release those endorphins. You, you become self-aware, you, you become real self-aware. You understand what, what triggers you, what heightens those, those symptoms or issues. So the music I listen to, if I'm not working out, I'm not pumped up and I'm just going about my day-to-day -day business, I want to listen to reggae or something calm, cool or collective. If I'm in the gym, five finger death punches, you know, hundred percent. Okay. And I'm all over it. Um, you know, that'll be my go-to, but but understanding what what external stimulus heightened those responses to your service related issues is also, you know, self-awareness, period, is detrimental to mitigating these symptoms um, naturally. So once I got on that structural st structured schedule, started working out, I started I obviously got rid of the booze, got rid of the medication. Um, I started doing proper nutrition diet. Um, I got linked up with individuals who are like minded doing the same things. Um, and I still have struggles. That's never going to change. We're all going to have struggles. Um, you know, there's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. But when you're not self-medicating, when you're not on traditional medications with modern medicine. Um, when, and, and not on booze. And not on booze. <laughs> and, and when you're when you're actively engaging in your own self-awareness and health, um, you, you start to understand that these symptoms, like when I still go through my depression bouts or I still go through my anxiety bouts, right? It's never going to go away but I can learn to live with it in a productive manner and mitigate it. And, and over time, slowly kind of retrain my central nervous system. So, so you are, you know, over time you can, you can almost get rid of PTSD, but it's, but it's, it's understanding and being self-aware. Um, and it's not easy. It's not a pill, right? It's not a quick fix. Um, so all these things and finding that that really worked for me and obviously going out kayaking, uh, going out hiking, you know, I grew up on Whidbey Island in Washington state is where I was originally from. So those are things that I grew up doing. Um, so once I started engaging in those activities again, coupled with proper diet and nutrition, um, I saw a, a dramatic change in my ability um, just, just to navigate the civilian world, be around other people, um, you know, mit mitigate negative responses to external stimulus that shouldn't, you know, heighten my response, but it's going to just, just because you're reintegrating, you're coming from, you know, a structured environment. You know, my, my formidable years were in the military on the active duty line. Um, so it's going to be hard, you know, to, to translate that thought process and all those things to, to the civilian world to, to be productive in the community without being looked at in a negative manner because PTSD and, and wartime is so stigmatized, right? Those service related issues are stigmatized within the society. So I want to break down real quick the, yeah. because I know people who have tried to get off the SSRIs and have real serious issues. 
uh, with the cold turkey thing. So you got off how many cold turkey at one time? Oh, it had, let's see, Prozosin, Gabapentin, Altram, um, Lorazepam. Um, oh my goodness, there's more too. Uh, oh, there's at least a few more. Probably so six, 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 six or seven, yeah. Safely. Probably six so or you seven. did that all cold turkey? All cold turkey. And uh, and how the, the, long did it take you to get through it? And what were your... You know, what was going through your mind? What was your body doing and all those things? Uh, so when I first started getting off those medications, cold turkey, it, it sucked. It was it was at least two two weeks, maybe even three, to be honest with you. Okay. Heart palpitations, cold sweats, not sleeping at night. Um, it's like your body goes through the shock process because these drugs are no longer in your system. Right. And the major majority of the drugs that they give you, right, like SSRIs, are meant to build up in your system. They're meant to build up through your system or, or antipsychotics or other things that they used to treat these service related issues are meant to build up in your system. So then then when you get off on cold turkey, that's why a lot of people go to high school or to a hospital, sorry, or to inpatient programs to titrate off these meds. You know, unfortunately, modern doctors don't really like to, to see you titrate off of what they prescribe. Right. Or what the VA prescribed because they don't want it to go out of insurance. You're breaking, you're breaking free, bro. Yeah. I'm breaking, I'm breaking free. I'm breaking free. I'm taking the chains off. It's like uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, but, it's, it's the big Indian and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Leave it, leave it, <laughs> uh, leave it in the building. Bro. But, but it was, yeah, it was easily, you know, two to three weeks of embracing the suck. And that's what you got to do. It's, it's hard. It's not easy. I still struggle every day. I still struggle every day. Some days are great too. And some days are horrible. You know, some days I still don't want to get out of bed, but I don't have a choice. And you pull yourself out of bed, you make it happen because you're setting a stand, a standard, you're setting an example and you're setting a precedence for other people to follow by. Right. Right. Because the way that the way what the way we don't live on the memories of our brothers and sisters who have made the ultimate sacrifice. I haven't done shit. OK. In, in the grand scheme of things and and more or anything else, I haven't, I haven't done nothing. But the way we live on the memories of our brothers and sisters is by actively engaging in our health after we leave service and being the best parents that we can be, having the best lives that we can have, being the best community members that we can be, because that shows who we are, the experiences we had, what, how they formed us. And, and, and it sets a precedence that, you know, PTSD or TBI or service related issues. And just because people go to war, do things to, to make this country free doesn't mean they need to be in a cage the rest of their lives afterwards or be put on severe antipsychotics or medications yeah. afterwards. Jeff, go ahead, buddy. No, that's heavy, man. That's heavy. And I mean, not in any way to, to minimize, I mean, you're talking about PTSD, which is huge, but I think something you brought up is really at the crux of like self-defense and self-care and that's self-awareness. I mean, you can't fix a problem unless you're aware that there is a problem, whether it's like I said, mental, spiritual, psychological, your relationships, being aware of things that aren't don't don't aren't lending itself to your higher self. There, there has to be at, at the root of that a certain level of self awareness to start. Like you said, mitigating certain things that either trigger you or are toxic for you. Again, at, at the root, I think of a, a lot of these conversations we're going to be having is something you mentioned, which is self awareness. Yeah, absolutely right. And and so that's the tagline of of our nonprofit: is healthy mind, healthy life. Right. You take care of your body, you take care of your mind, you keep your mind healthy, you're going to have a healthy life, you're going to be more productive. And again, that doesn't mean there's not going to be good days or bad days. And then that correlates just just like you were saying, Jeff, that correlates right into our supplement company and the standard we want to, to set with that, right? You know, downrange supplements is a method to, to create high quality products that, that that's ran by a combat veteran owned and operated um, group, um, but also supporting a combat veteran, you know, owned and operated nonprofit giving back to our community and continually improve your fighting position is a tagline there. And, and when we say continually improve your fighting position, right, obviously we do stuff with the pro fight community. No, we support Sean, we support Colton, we support Ryan, yeah. you know, Pat, we love you, brother. Um, but continue to improve your fighting position. That's what correlates to physically, emotionally, mentally. You're continually improving your fighting position, your position in life at all times and your ability to execute, whether that's on the mats, whether that's on the range, whether that's downrange or whether that's just being a parent and being yeah. a productive person and getting yourself to, to a better a better place in life, period, to be more proactive, right? Because it's all in the eye of the beholder. It's, you know, not everyone's got to be a pro athlete or not everyone's got to be an operator. Not everyone's got to have combat experience. It's what are you doing just to better yourself, to make sure you, your best foot's forward every morning. You're setting that example for your kids. You're set, more importantly, setting that example for the community and society in general so, so we can start promoting, you know, healthy mind, body um, um, methods and techniques just overall, right? Right. That's yeah, a, the, that's the thing that we see, you know, it's, it's hard for Americans 
because they're bombarded with a lot of information, commercials and things about products that, you know, don't solve health issues. And so, you know, downrange supplements and, and some other supplement companies, downrange is the only veteran owned one that I support. Uh, but, you know, people understanding how to improve their health, how to clean their body out, how to clean their cells throughout their entire body, reset their gut bacteria, all those different things. You know, you've got to have your health to be able to move forward in all those ranges of, of self-defense that you want to. It starts with your health, right? No, oh, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and if you're not maintaining, you know, proper health, proper nutrition, a, a proper structured routine, um, more importantly for people struggling with service-related issues or, or any health conditions that doesn't need to be serviced, um, but just just generally people that might not have mental health issues, um, but but then just continually staying on top of that stuff on a, on a daily basis is, is, is extremely important. Extremely important yeah. today. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, buddy. I mean, yeah, maintaining, like, that's kind of what screwed up so many people, like, with COVID. It, and regardless of the routines, whether it was going to, like, AA meetings or whatever it was they're struggling with, they wound up fucking up their their routine. And, and, you know, you guys know not only veteran suicides every 22 seconds, like, the number of the people, of domestic violence, emergency room visits, suicides went through the roof because people's routine got screwed up. I mean, that... that well, well, yeah, overdoses, all kinds of stuff. All yeah. of it, man. And, and it's so preventable, you know, Jeff. And that never made sense to me because you're you're talking about a virus that has a 97% survival rate, right? 99.7. But, but, yeah, what a, what a ridiculously high. And and yes. I get it, you know, we should all be cautious. We should we we should we should all be aware of people that have immune deficiency. Whatever. Wash your hands, personal care. I understand, I get that. Um, but, but six six months comes six, down to terrain though. Yeah. The, the, I don't want to get this because not to interrupt you, but no, you're good. you know, there's germ theory and there's terrain theory, right? They, they, again, we hear out of the news folks and you know, all the folks at the health departments and all of this saying, yeah, disinfect your hands, wash down everything, you know, stay away from people, all this other stuff. And then at, out of the other side of their mouth, they'll say, well, people that are obese and have, you know, comorbidities are extra, you know, vulnerable to these types of things like the flu and other things like that. So what they're saying is actually it's the terrain that the germs and the bacteria and the viruses land on, um, you know, will dictate, you know, how your chances are going to be. So ultimately it comes down to immune system and being healthy, working out, eating right, taking proper supplementation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and <clears throat> the thing you got to realize here, and again, that's, you know, this big pharma in our society in general, you know, keeping people sick is return business. Right. You get, you get someone healthy, they're not, they're not coming back. Um, but as unfortunate as it is to go, go back to the point, you know, when people were, were in quarantine and it messed up their routines, Jeff, six months, six months of social isolation causes high blood pressure, diabetes, hypertension, depression. The, these are all scientific facts in modern medicine journals, right? So these same people that want you inside confined and restricted, right? So you don't die from this 99% survivable virus are giving you a much higher probability of actually becoming sick and, and actually degrading your immune system because now you're isolated from everyone else and everything too. Right. Um, and, and all the depression and everything else, you're, you're going to have a higher probability of coming out of quarantine and way worse health. Well, and even, even what they were doing with the chemi mean, granted, this is kind of a throwback to our old show, Pat, but might as well just keep it 100 what they were doing <laughs> with the kids in schools. Like then now it's like, you know, with the, between the masks and the six feet apart and you can't eat lunch at this table with your friends. Now it's like, oops, we kind of dropped the ball on, you know, the protocols as far as how it went with kids. In my opinion, they knew what the fuck they were doing. Absolutely. And okay. then like hindsight, they're acting like hindsight's, you know, hindsight's 2020. Well, if we had only known, like you said, we know about what isolation does to people, you know, whether it's physiological, like you said, from a mental standpoint or from a physical standpoint, high blood yeah, pressure, like diabetes, et cetera. Psychological damage alone is severe. I mean, it's it's affected a lot of people. It, it affected me quite a bit, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm a person that was out doing broadcasts almost every week around large crowds, you know, traveling, all that sort of stuff, and then suddenly being locked in the house and not being able to go to my favorite restaurants and all that sort of stuff and um, hang out with my friends because everything else was closed down. It was, it was, it was a bit ridiculous, but I'm going to shift gears here in terms of now that we've talked about health, psychological, mental, spiritual, all of that, you know, I want to talk a little bit about actual physical self-defense, obviously, because you're a combat veteran, you know, and we've got an awful lot of Americans that are concealed carry. Um, and, you know, I have always said, you know, humans are the only animal that don't know how to defend themselves, that aren't born with self-defense instincts from birth, where 
every other animal, I mean, a, a little puppy wolf will bite your ass if you go around it, right? Yeah. They're just born with self-defense instincts. Yeah. So you have to be taught. And, you know, what are your thoughts on people who go out and get a concealed carry with the minimum qualifications, uh, don't learn how to even keep the weapon, don't do any self, you know, self-defense, empty hand self-defense, you know, again, you know, all of those things that are going on. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you, you need to be continually improving your fighting position in life, period, right? So the biggest thing, and you look up statistics, back when I was in college, I actually did a paper on gun laws. Um, and, and it was actually shown that the majority of accidental shootings were, were in homes with, with children who had not been educated on the firearms or educated on the process. So you have a parent, right, that shows your kid the gun and says, hey, it's here, don't touch it. Now it's a forbidden fruit. You're not teaching them anything about it. You're, you're not giving them instruction, but it's a child. So now that child wants to know why it's so important to mom or dad. Why is this thing so cool? Now it's like a shiny object. Don't press the button, right? The kid wants to press the button. Yeah, don't spill your milk. They'll but, spill right? it. Now, now, now the child's grabbing the gun. Next thing you know, they're shooting themselves because they didn't know. They weren't educated, right? So education in anything is key. Sure. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Education in anything is key. Knowledge is power. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance causes costs lives. It, complacency costs lives, right? right. Um, so in my opinion, you, sh you should, individuals, you should absolutely have your second amendment, right? You, sh you should be training yourself and maintaining some sort, um, you know, of an, an instructional integrity in terms of your knowledge base on weapons, firearms, hand-to-hand -hand combat, going to training with guys like you, right? Guys like Ryan or Sean, whatever the case may be. Um, but it's imperative that, that people be teaching their children teaching themselves, even the most basic, you know, handgun classes or self-defense classes to be able to protect themselves and their families because cr criminals aren't going to stop being criminals. Okay. Just because you tell a criminal he can't have a gun because he's a felon, he's not going to stop carrying a gun. And, and if you make it harder for law abiding citizens or people are scared, you know, to, to carry guns or protect themselves, you're now becoming a victim. There's no sense in making yourself a victim right. when you don't need to be. It doesn't mean go out there and, and be one of those guys that's imprinting <laughs> with you. I hate imprinters, man. Concealed carries, you know, they make sure wear a nice tight shirt. Yeah, I'm wearing a big old handgun. You know, yeah. that's the first target I'm looking for if I am a criminal. Because yeah. I'm going to say that guy's armed. I need to take out that threat before anyone else, right? If I'm going to rob this place. Yeah, same thing with open carry. Why would you let the criminal know you're carrying a gun? Because you're going to be the first person they're going to sneak up on and shoot. Yeah. You start doing what they're doing, you know. So that makes perfect sense, yeah. But, but well, as it also, as it relates, is, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's it's absolutely imperative to maintain education. You don't have to like guns. You don't have to agree with guns. Yes, I understand people. There's bad people sometimes that use guns, but that doesn't make guns bad. They can serve a purpose from self-sustaining food, right, and, and giving you sustainment um, to protecting your family, your life, liberty, and your property. So it's imperative to have knowledge about those things. They're not going anywhere. So Well, if, if only swords existed right now, and that was the most dangerous weapon, I would, hope that, I would hope that citizens would be able to carry swords, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, sure. that only makes sense. If if the bad guys can carry guns, I, <laughs> I, I should be able to protect myself. That's just, you know, common sense. And they are, you know, it's in middle school, sixth grade in wood shop, learning how to run a bandsaw um, you yeah. know, and, and other power power tools that are that can chop your hand off uh, in a blink of an eye. So why shouldn't you teach? There's a dangerous end and a safe end to everything. When of course. To... Well, and like you said, going back to, to training like anything else, you just don't you don't get a driver's license without some measure of training how to drive a car. And I was curious um, the role I mean, in, in training, because I think a lot of people, not a lot, but many people are freaked out about guns, even though like oh, I want one. But it just there's that that fear element. What role do you think not only just training, but like muscle memory has? So when like if, if you've never been faced with something or trained on it, you're like, oh, fuck, what do I do? Kind of what do I do as opposed to being placed in the most simulated real life experiences and then having that muscle memory to to know exactly what to do or, you know, whatever training and protocols involved with firearm self-defense. The, the role of muscle memory is my question. That, that knowledge, knowledge is power, man. You absolutely need muscle memory, right? Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And that's 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 it in anything creating muscle memory from a self-defense or from a tactical standpoint, right? So like, and, and I'm no one special. Again, let me reiterate that. I went through infantry training, did all that stuff, you know, but we'd go out to, um, you know, OP6 Alpha or do uh, military mount training, you know, or CQM and CQB, and you do highs and lows, rolling tees, um, you know, different button hooks, different methods, fire team formations and movements, but you do them. Oh, we go out there for two weeks at a time. 
and you do the same movement over and over and over and over and over and over again because you're creating muscle memory. So then when your body is put in a situation, right, where that fight or flight, flight or was flight, fight or was fight or re, flight response mode comes in. Sorry, guys, uh, too much pre-workout this morning. <laughs> comes in, comes, comes in. Your body can naturally react because it's already conditioned, right? In, in terms of the, the the muscle memory and the motor skills needed for that at next action, because you've gone through it over and over and over. So a way to do that, right, as, as a civilian or as just a regular citizen. Um, bettering themselves or continually improving their playing position at home. There's tons of things that you can do in terms of small arms, you know, go, go get one of those dry fire lasers. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Sit at home, sit at home and just practice bringing that up, out, out, up, out, firing, understanding where your safety is, understanding where, you know, if, if you have a standard thumb safety, if you have, you know, a beaver tail and a trigger safety, so because it's made more for self-defense, you know, so you're, you're meant, you know, you're meant to fire that weapon when you're handling and those. It. And those can be Bluetooth into your laptop and yeah. it'll tell you, how accurate your shooting was and things like that. Right? Cool. So, so you can, you can completely, you know, they have those kits that, that they make and you can completely basically make your weapon safe. You can, they even make bolts. You can switch out in M4s, all kinds of stuff, man. Um, so, so there's, there's no way you can do anything wrong, but dry fire, dry fire, go through the motions, dry fire that weapon, put, you know, practice putting rounds on target. And when I say rounds on target, you know, it's a laser, right. Um, but they make little, little, little uh, targets too. Where, where it'll tell you where you're hitting and those lasers will come back and read and you can read it through your laptop. There's right. all kinds of stuff, but wow. absolutely. The, the point is, is there's a tons of, of methods and techniques um, that you can utilize um, to learn proper small arms handling, right? right. Um, and proper small arms execution um, in terms of self-defense that, that you can purchase, you know, at any firearm shop or online. Right. And basically, I mean, obviously the safety is the most important thing to constantly practice and, and reiterate with people, but, you know, just the simple things like finding cover, you know, is so important when it comes to bullets are flying around. And then what's what's the backdrop? If, if there's a bad guy shooting, what's behind it? Right. Yep. So that's things that a lot of people just don't think about. Understanding and, cops have, and cops have to deal with that and soldiers as well. Yep. Right. In certain uh, scenarios where, you know, there's there's innocent people around, and, but the bad guy doesn't care. They're indiscriminate yeah. bullets. So there's a lot of stuff that can get involved in that to complicate the situation, right? Well, yeah, and that's that's where situational awareness comes in, right? Like when we were downrange, they would have uh, you'd have to have PID. There was different levels of PID, right? Positive identification. So like when I first went to, to Iraq, we were, it was like uh, 51% PID or something like that, um, and then you know it could be 60% PID. So so for you to be able to fire back, right? So and that's taken into account, like you're talking about civilians, everything else surrounding the area, hearts and minds, guys. So okay, you're getting shot at. Where are you getting shot at from? Can you see the weapon in the person's hands? Where are the bullets going in what direction? So th the level of information you need to go through a, an escalation of force in order to return fire for that PID level is just dependent, right? If it's 50% PID or something, okay, there's a guy shooting at us over there, return fire, right? You know, if it's some ridiculously restricted level, you know, you might basically be having to just be taking rounds for a while until you identify everyone and their targets and their surroundings, but before higher up will allow you to return fire. Well, that was, yeah, I've talked to a lot of guys, yeah, like that where they, you know, the rule of, rules of engagement were ridiculous where, you know, okay, we know they're bad guys. We can see they're coming through with a bunch of camels and they've got a ton, tons of ammo, RPGs, all kinds of crazy stuff that they're, they're bringing in. And they got to get out there and, and do a tap dance and stuff to get them to shoot at them before they can <laughs> shoot back at them. It's crazy. But uh, I was going to bring up too, you know, when you came back and had to deal with a lot of, because the selfless acts that you witnessed and probably obviously took part in, in looking out for your buddies that are you know, your, your combat, you know, your combat buddies to your left and right. And then you come back to a civilian society. You've been listening to the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast with Jeffrey Wilson and Pat Militich. Watch the complete interview on Red Voice Media Premium using the link below, completely uncensored and ad-free. Not a member yet? Try it for a buck.